Welcome to this meeting of the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel and USA Today Network Wisconsin's editorial board, where we'll be interviewing Wisconsin Supreme Court candidate Janet Protasevich. I'm Jim Fitzhenry, the Ideas Lab editor here at the Milwaukee Journal. On April 4th, Wisconsin voters will be going to the polls in the spring election. The ballot includes a host of nonpartisan offices for local government, including county, circuit court, city, villages, and school boards. In addition, there are three statewide referendum questions. The first two center on amending the state constitution regarding bail for criminal suspects charged with serious crimes who may present a danger to the community. The third focuses on certain on requirements in order to receive certain state benefits. Finally, in a race that is capturing national attention, voters will elect a new justice to the Supreme Court to replace Justice Patience Roggensack, who is retiring after 20 years on the court. For more information on registering to vote and what's on your local ballot, go to myvote.wisconsin.gov. Today, we're welcoming Supreme Court candidate Janet Kodasevich. But first, a little bit more about the Supreme Court's role in state government. It is Wisconsin's highest court, consisting of seven justices who are elected to 10-year terms in statewide nonpartisan elections. As Wisconsin's court of last resort, the Supreme Court has appellate jurisdiction over all Wisconsin courts and has the discretion to determine which appeals it will hear. The Supreme Court may also hear cases that begin in the high court known as original actions. In addition, the Supreme Court has administrative authority over all courts in Wisconsin. The outcome of the April election will determine whether conservative or liberal factions of the court hold a majority. Currently, conservatives have held majorities for more than a decade. It is already the most expensive judicial race in the nation's history, with about 27 million spent so far on television ads alone. Our guest today is a circuit court judge in Milwaukee County, where she was a first elected in 2014 and re-elected in 2020. Previously, she was an assistant district attorney for 26 years. She's a graduate of UW-Milwaukee and earned her law degree from Marquette University, where she later was an adjunct professor at the law school. First question, Judge, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. Uh, both you and your opponent have been highly critical of each other for bringing politics into a nonpartisan race, but each of you have been vocal in calling. But you have been vocal in calling the state's election max rigged and saying a woman should be able to choose whether to continue pregnancies. Typically, judicial candidates refrain from such broad statements. How can you assure voters you will rule on the law as written, not what you personally believe the law should be? So I would say this, I think it's critically important that the voters know what the values are of the person that they're going to elect to this highest seat. Critically important. You know, my values are out front. I've been very, very much making sure that the electorate knows. I believe a woman has a right to make her own reproductive health care decisions. And I believe that our maps are rigged. I mean, I've said before, I don't think you could convince anybody that those maps are fair. Those are my personal opinions. And, you know, bottom line is, I follow the law, I uphold the Constitution. My personal opinions, my personal values, I think, should be transparent to the voters of the people of Wisconsin. But what people need to know is every decision that I make, every decision, whether my personal opinion <laughs> runs contrary to it, will be based on the law and the Constitution 100%. Do you have any cases where you ruled um, in a way that was contrary to your personal opinions? I would say that in the circuit court, what you're doing is you're following the statutes, you know, to a T. You have to. You absolutely have to. That's what your role is. There are times that I do things I would prefer not to do. There are times that so, I such think... As, such as what? Well, let's take a look at, you know, some of the evidentiary rules, right? Some of the evidentiary rules where I have to let evidence in or I don't let evidence in. I may have had a different opinion. Let's talk about, you know, we have the ability for people to have a case expunged, right? And I think that's critically important because all sorts of collateral, you know, horrible collateral things are attached when you are convicted of, you know, a crime. The way the statute is written, 
a judge has to make a decision at the time they render a sentence on whether or not somebody will have their matter expunged. How do I think it should be written? I think they should show us during the term that they're on probation or supervision that they're going to follow the rules, they're going to get the treatment that they need, they're going to engage in the community services that they're ordered to engage in, rather than having me guess whether or not they're going to do that. You know, there are also cases where, you know, I'll do a jury trial, say an OWI, 5th, 6th, or 7th, right? Mm -hmm. That jury doesn't know what the number of the offense is. I find that somewhat disingenuous. We don't tell them anything about that, anything about the background. You know, we just basically tell them what the charge is. So you always follow the law, even though you think, hmm, maybe this could have been done a little bit differently. It's funny that you bring up expungement. Um, but, you know, it's very hard here on African Americans. And it's been labeled one of the um, uh, worst places for uh, blacks to live. When, when, it, when it comes or comes to it, uh, how do you... What are your thoughts on, on on changing any of that? Like, especially if a person uh, has done everything right and they still face all these obstacles. I, I've written a lot of columns and things like that. that uh, blacks face like these odds that they just can't seem to overcome. You've been labeled as this liberal person who uh, has been the person that looks out for those who are facing these obstacles. How do you view that? I agree with you, and it's very challenging in the criminal justice system. You know, we have to keep the community safe. Obviously, that's a paramount concern. But that doesn't mean that we can't have criminal justice reform. And I take a look at what's going on in those courtrooms. I take a look at the fact that we don't necessarily have enough services available to people who come into our courtrooms. You look at everything from, you know, the way the courthouse is run to the services, to the kind of courts that we have. You know, we have domestic violence courts with treatment programs. We don't have enough treatment programs. We have people on waiting lists. We have drug and alcohol potential treatment. We have people on waiting lists. We have um, one drug treatment court. We have one veterans court. In my opinion, we don't have enough services for a county with over a million people and people coming in and out of our criminal justice system. I think we need more services. We need to offer more. I was in domestic violence court. And that was a very interesting assignment. A lot of the people in domestic violence court have committed, you know, a battery, a disorderly conduct, a criminal damage to property. They're not bad people. They're people that are stretched to the limit by the fact that they have a limited education, maybe a minor drug and alcohol problem, probably not a high school diploma, maybe a number of children that they need to raise potentially not good role models in their life. You know, they're set up for failure. So we place people on probation and we send them to some programming. On Friday afternoons in domestic violence court, we would come in and we do what we're called probation reviews. I cannot tell you the amount of people who went to a class, maybe a batterer's intervention class, and would say to me, I didn't want to go to this class. I thought it was just going to be one more thing that I had to do and look how much I got out of it. So, you know, there's really good programming for people, but we don't have enough good programming for people. And, you know, there are other issues, you know, that concern me as well, obviously, about the, you know, criminal justice system. But I think we need more programming. I think we need more services up front. Just a quick question. Everybody here has questions, I'm sure. But a quick question. Um, do you think there are too many people in jail and prison right now in Wisconsin? Yes or no? I'm going to have to say, in Milwaukee, the only people that I would be familiar with would be the people coming out of Milwaukee County. The people coming out of Milwaukee County, I would say no. We are very, very careful who is sentenced to prison out of Milwaukee County. People who are really a danger to the community. And you have, don't have an opinion on the state as to whether the state has too many people locked up? Correct. I don't know what other counties are doing. I really only know what Milwaukee County does. Can I do a follow-up? Do, do we have too many people on probation and parole? No, I don't think so. And, you know, I think we need more parole officers, and I think we need more services. I really think we need more really good services to help people. Because you need a, you know, this has always been my thought process. You need to give people a chance. You need to give them a fighting chance. We've got to give them the tools to have that fighting chance. I want to circle back to something that Jim talked about at the beginning. 
of sort of the tenor of this campaign in which you've described you feel like you need to thread the needle and sharing your values right. and how you would rule or not rule, yet the rhetoric that you've fallen back to are things like my opponent is corrupt, these maps are rigged, it's mm -hmm. very, very strong rhetoric that seems aimed at addressing or appealing to a certain, you know, part of the electorate. Do you think that kind of language is, is appropriate for a, for a Supreme Court justice and for a campaign like this? For this particular candidate, yes. He's not a conservative. He's an extremist. This is a guy who worked with, you know, the great, you know, elector scheme, right? This is a guy that Andrew Hitt, who was running the, you know, had to testify in front of the January 6th committee, said that he had extensive conversations with him about the fake electors. This is, you know, a guy who was working out of the Republican Party headquarters during the time he was campaigning last time he ran. This is a person who was still on the Republican Party payroll in December of 2022. He announced his candidacy in September of 2022. This is a real partisan. This is an extremist. This isn't, you know, a normal conservative. And I am very, very hopeful that I will be able to earn the votes of conservatives and independents and progressives. I'm very, very hopeful. But he's a different kind of candidate. In my opinion, he is a dangerous candidate. And the state citizenry needs to know that. But wouldn't he, I imagine when he's sitting here, he'll probably say the same thing, that I'm facing an extreme candidate who's dangerous to the state of Wisconsin and all this rhetoric is warranted. But how do we you know, create a, a dialogue around things. So you could make the same points without using the, the, the level of the extent of the rhetoric that's being, being made right now. I don't think you can. I don't think you can underscore how extreme he is. And let's talk about what you just said, him sitting in the same chair and saying the same thing. I have a 35-year record in the criminal justice system, in the court system. 25 years as an assistant district attorney, actually 26, and almost 10 on the circuit court bench. My record is wide open. Anybody can look at it. Every single case that I have is an open book. And quite frankly, the Republican Party of the state of Wisconsin did an open records request for every single one of my cases. And they're looking at every one of my cases. He was on the Supreme Court for four years. And what did he do? I would really ask you to challenge him and say, when did you ever, ever come down, not on the side of special interests? When did you ever not come down in the way that your cronies wanted you to? You know, we have Brian Hagedorn on our Supreme Court. Brian Hagedorn, he's labeled a conservative. He occasionally votes with a different block. What did Dan Kelly call him? Supremely unreliable. That's what this guy is. He called somebody who didn't vote in lockstep supremely unreliable. This is somebody who's telling the community in every way possible that he is going to do exactly what he is expected to do. You'll never hear me say that. Nobody's ever heard me say Rebecca Dallet or Jill Karofsky or Ann Walsh Bradley or anybody else is supremely unreliable. You'd never hear me say that. You're supposed to be independent. That's what you're supposed to be. So just one other follow-up there. So if, if Justice Hagedorn is an example who says he'll follow the rule of you know the law wherever it takes him, and he does show up on both sides yeah. of the mix, and I think Dan asked us before, I just want to come back and put a point on it. Are there some examples of cases that even take the Supreme Court past rulings where you would have sided in a way that would be adverse to the, the interests of the Democrats, the liberals, whomever the constituencies. So, you know, the case is that, you know, when we really think about the liberals and the, you know, the liberal branch, you know, the liberal mm -hmm. block, you know, we talk about, you know, the voting cases and the maps. Mm -hmm. And of course, I would agree with them in that, in the mm -hmm. dissent. Do you have any other ideas of types of cases that, you know, come to mind when you ask that question? You know, I guess I'm asking if you had been on the court, say, for the, the same stretch that former Justice Kelly was, where, or on any stretch, where would you have differed from the, the liberal justices on those cases? Well, I would have to say this. Every single case is different. Every single case requires an in-depth analysis. I would expect that I would have differed from them from time to time. 
And you know, and I've told everybody, don't expect me to be that reliable, you know, progressive justice. I will always be fair. I will always be independent. Every single decision will always be rooted in the law. Drop boxes were outlawed. Do you agree with that decision? My personal opinion, again, my personal value, is that everybody's vote should count. Everybody should have the absolute ability to be able to vote in a way that is secure. Of course, we want secure elections. Do I personally think the drop boxes should have been outlawed? I don't. I don't think the drop boxes should have been outlawed personally. I think we have a representative democracy, and it is critically important you know, that everybody's vote counts. I would say when I look at what's happening on that Supreme Court, you know, outlawing the drop boxes, taking a look at those maps, it's pretty clear to me that there's one underlying goal, and that's to suppress votes, right? When you look at, um, you know, the Biden v. Trump case, you know, that came to our Wisconsin Supreme Court, where were they trying to throw out the votes? Only Milwaukee County and Dane County. I mean, it's telling you exactly what they are doing, which is trying to suppress the vote. What about the stay-at-home order? Would you would you have voted with the conservatives or the liberals on that? I'm not sure. And I've thought about that stay-at-home order, you know, and I certainly understand public safety 100%. Um, I'm not sure where I would have come down on that. Can you give us some examples of good rulings and bad rulings that the state and, and U.S. Supreme Court have made, but you can't say Dobbs. I can't say Dobbs? No, no you can't. You can't say we, Dobbs. We know that's your, <laughs> okay. you mention that everywhere. <laughs> I know. We know so, how you feel about Dobbs. <laughs> all right, I would tell you, I would say the Virginia Military Institute case that the United States Supreme Court came down on that was authored by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. It's a very, very good decision about allowing women into the Virginia Military Institute. That was a very, very good case. And, you know, I think she's got, you know, that train of cases that when she was an advocate, you know, advocating for women's rights and women being paid equal. And then you get that Virginia military case. You know, there was a case that came out of the United States Supreme Court in the um, last session as well about environmental concerns, um, the EPA and reducing the ability to, you know, keep our environment clean. That's a case, you know, another case that I, you know, I think is critically important. What about um, bad cases, not Dobbs? Um, <laughs> the EPA case, uh, okay. bad case. No. That was mm -hmm. bad. Yeah, okay. Bad case. Okay. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting that you mentioned, um, you know, the drop boxes. Like, what would you do to ensure that the Supreme Court is functioning as well as it can? How, how would you have changed that? What would, what would you have done? I would say this. I can't tell you specifically what I would have done. I was in Madison speaking to a group of Native American leaders last week, and we were at the Concourse Hotel. And, you know, it was kind of interesting because it really made me give people this example. We're in this beautiful hotel, and I'm in a ballroom. And I'm talking about issues that are, you know, pertinent to people, uh, you know, Native American people. And I said, you know, it is so critical that everybody understands about their right to vote and just how important that is and how much people fought for the right to vote. And I said, it's to me the great equalizer, that right to vote. The person who's staying in the nicest room in this hotel, if they have a penthouse, I don't know, <laughs> if they have a penthouse, the nicest suite, guess what? Their vote counts exactly the same as the person who's cleaning that room. And to me, it's the great equalizer that everybody's vote counts exactly the same. And if everybody's vote counts exactly the same, and people really understand that, and they get out to vote, significant changes can occur. Um, you, you said you started talking in a partisan way or sharing your values because of your opponent, but in fact, you started talking about your values before you knew who you were going to run against. Um, you could have easily run against Doro. Were you using this partisan talk, particularly on abortion, as a way to raise money? Um, because you've raised an enormous amount of money. The, the numbers show that nearly half of the money you've raised has been outside of Wisconsin. It, it's somewhat concerning that for a local, I mean, for a statewide office, that, that we've got all of these outside interests that are helping to determine who's going to win the race. 
Well, I don't know that those are outside interests because those are direct contributions to my campaign that you're reading about. Those are all direct contributions. People have asked, what do you think about the nationwide interest in this race? They've even said, what do you think about the international interest in this race? And I've said, I think it's a good thing. I really believe that Wisconsin is a microcosm of this whole country as a whole. You know, I was at an event with my opponent in Elkhart Lake two weeks ago, and he said everybody else should stay out of this race. It should just be Wisconsin. But this is the same guy who's bragging about how much money he could potentially bring in from independent expenditures. So what you're seeing are actual contributions to my campaign from across the country. That gives me the ability to communicate with people all over our state. That gives me the ability to be on TV. That gives me the ability to be on digital. That gives me the ability to travel all over this state and meet people and talk to people. In regard to Dobbs, I'll tell you, when I started thinking about this race last year, it was really the threat to our democracy. I started thinking about this race, kind of flirting with it in February, kind of really starting to have serious conversations about it last April, and then I announced in May. I think by then, I had a pretty good idea how the Dobbs decision was going to be rendered. A pretty good idea how that decision After it got was leaked, going to be everybody rendered. Everybody knew. Yeah, we all knew, right? So, you know, it is such a concerning issue. You know, it's the only female in this race. I don't want somebody else, including Dan Kelly, making those reproductive health care decisions. I think those should belong to you, women. You said there's a line <coughs> in terms of uh, <coughs> that there can be some restrictions on abortion that you think there's a line somewhere. Do you think that the pre-Dobbs level of no abortions after 20 weeks, do you think that's constitutional? Can you support that if you're on the bench? Can you repeat that? It, before Dobbs, the, the law was that you could not get an abortion after 20 weeks in Wisconsin, correct? Um, I'm wondering if you, if you are a judge, do you think that, that, would, that, that that's constitutional? Um, for the state to restrict abortions after 20 weeks? I think that that is probably constitutional. You know, there's got to be a line. I don't know that anybody is supporting, a, nobody's supporting abortion of a viable fetus, right? right? Nobody is. So, you know. But they are accusing you of doing that. Of course they are. <laughs> but I just want to know where the line is. So 20, you would be okay, you think, with 20 weeks? I think personally, probably. But remember, I'm looking at this from a legal standpoint. And I've told everybody, everybody that I've talked to, including women's groups, and to, including Democratic groups, you have to understand, I am making you no promises. I'm coming down based on what the arguments are, you know, what I think the law is. So can I ask a thought? So you would not recuse yourself from any kind of case involving the 1849 abortion law? No, no. I haven't received, you know, um, large sums of money from anybody advocating for that. I have received large sums of money from the Democratic Party of the state of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. That money that helps me, you know, get my message out. Because of that, I indicated earlier, and I stand by, I would recuse myself from any case in which the Democratic Party is a, you know, is a party. You have received, I think, the maximum personal donation from Madeline Lubar, who is a, who's on the board of Planned Parenthood. So there is a tie there. So I'm curious, you know, you've come out in support of stricter recusal right. rules. And you said you think that people should decide exactly what those rules are. But what do you personally think those rules should be? What would you recuse yourself from? Well, what I do now on the circuit court is I recuse myself, obviously, if I know a party or I ask them if they want me to recuse myself. You know, if I'm good friends with one of the lawyers, I always offer to recuse myself. I'd rather, you know, play it safe. You know, when I get a campaign contribution as a circuit court judge, <laughs> it's a very limited amount, and I haven't been in a contested race for a long time, so I haven't fundraised for a long time. Really, as to the amount given by an individual to a Supreme Court justice, I think we're all getting probably a lot of the maximum contributions. I don't know that that would be enough to make anybody say they need to recuse themselves, right? I don't know that I would think that would be enough. But I'm talking about the millions and millions of dollars of outside spending that are coming into these races. That's what I'm talking about, and that's why I think we need a recusal rule. Let's sit down with the public and say, where is the line drawn? What do you think? Then let's develop some recusal rules, and then a justice should recuse under the appropriate circumstances. 
you I mean, elaborate a little bit more on that? And that since we know, we know it's millions upon millions is too much, and the individual limit <laughs> is not enough right. to make it. But that's a big gap in there. Where in there are you drawing the line? Is it a million dollars? Is it five hundred thousand dollars? Where does it become problematic? That's what I think the public should weigh in on, because it's the public who needs to, you know, believe in the integrity and independence of their Supreme Court. I really think we need to have public hearings about that and then develop a recusal rule. So I don't really have a personal opinion, at least one that I think is, you know, relevant sharing, but I think we absolutely need a recusal rule. You might know I am the only candidate who believes in a recusal rule. I think we need one. I absolutely do. Right. But what you're describing, yes, one thing for the public to come up with its rule. Yeah. But you're on your own saying you're going to recuse yourself from, you know, the Democratic cases with the party. But that's at whatever many millions of dollars, isn't it? What else would you, where would you draw the line on your cases on a personal basis to say I shouldn't be engaged with that, to set an example yeah. for the rest of the court? So I'll tell you this, and this is where it's a little bit complicated. An individual can contribute up to $20,000 on a Supreme Court campaign. An organization or a PAC can contribute $18,000. The only entity that can contribute above that is the Democratic or Republican Party to a candidate. That's the only entity. So I would have to know more about potentially what's going on on the outside. I don't know who's spending what on my behalf. I actually have absolutely no idea. We can't coordinate with people doing the independent expenditures, so I just don't know, which is why I really don't have an answer for the question, but which is why I responded in regard to the Democratic Party, the one entity who is able to give me large amounts of money, of course it's appropriate to recuse. Before you were a judge, you protested against uh, Act 10. You also signed the recall petition. I did. Um, so would you recuse yourself if the Act 10 legislation comes goes before the Supreme Court? You know, I'd have to think about it. Um, I was interviewed by the New York Times, and they said, what do you think? Do you think that um, Act 10 was unconstitutional? And I said, yeah, I agree with the dissent in that case. You know, the dissent, I think Ann Walsh Bradley authored the dissent in that case. And I said, I do agree with the dissent in that case. Um, Given the fact that I marched, given the fact that I signed the recall petition, would I recuse myself? Maybe, maybe, but I don't know for sure. Maybe. And can you be a little more solid? Can you tell us that you think, I mean, what you've clearly stated with the Democratic Party, you wouldn't do that. Um, it, it seems like being a, an activist in those those areas, I mean, yeah. it, it, it seems like that's an important line too. It's not all about the money. Um, the fact that you were signed the recall you just say maybe that you won't? You yeah, won't? maybe, because I don't know how the issues would be framed, if they're framed at all. I don't know if that's going to come in front of the court again, quite frankly. I have no idea. So it's a maybe. It's a solid maybe. There's been this issue, particularly in conservative media, where um, there have been allegations of elder abuse by uh, the children of your first husband. Um, one of, one of the sons in particular has said that he's seen you physically abuse your first husband. Do you have any response to what they've said and what's been put out there about you? I know this is 30 years ago, but, right. which, but which, what's your response to what's been said about you? Well, it's an absolute lie, 100%. You know, to me, it smacks of some type of level of desperation uh, by any media outlet that would promote that. It is an incredible lie. And, you know, I have um, expected, you know, my record to be twisted the way it has been in this campaign. I certainly expected that. I expected mudslinging, lies that delved to this level, <laughs> lies by a twice convicted felon who um, I don't know has ever held a job. I am surprised that anybody's even giving those, you know, the time of day, quite frankly. What do you think about suing about to try to stop the allegations? You're saying they're absolute lies. Is there anything you could do to, to, to respond to what they're saying? My family and I have been discussing that, and right now my focus is winning this election. On April 5th, we will pivot and make some decisions about that. Have you contacted an attorney about this? We will on April 5th. <laughs> okay. 
Yes. I, I have another. I have a question as a follow up to this one. So um, I understand Wisconsin right now had a story that said um, I quoted a form, former stepson and a uh, family friend of your ex husband who said that they heard you use the N word. Um, and I just wanted to see what did you do that or not or. You know, I've never done that, and I think if you ask anybody I know, they would be stunned. One of my best friends came over yesterday morning. We were going to Racine to visit predominantly African-American churches, and she cried. She said, I've never heard you do that. My clerk is an African-American. She heard about it. She called me last week, and I said, oh, boy, what do you think? And she said, I just feel so horrible. So I went to one of the churches yesterday, and of course when you have allegations like this hurled at you, I thought I'd better call these pastors and bishops before I get to their church. And the first bishop I called said, you sound so sad. And I said, you know, this campaign is so hard, and I think this is why people don't do this. This campaign is so hard. And I walked into his church, and he said, you look so sad. And I said, it's been a really hard two weeks. And he gave me a hug, and he said, the truth will be known. I didn't even know him. But this has been incredibly hard on me. It's been incredibly hard on my family. And, you know, there is absolutely no truth to those statements. Again, uh, like Dan suggested. And it's the same lost, stepson, right? Uh, it's, it's the same person. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so was this a shock to you? I mean, that, that's a pretty major allegation. I was you? stunned. Um, I was stunned. You know, when I started thinking about this race, I thought, oh, my first marriage, you know, the biggest mistake I've made in my life, is that going to be coming out, you know, in public? I didn't expect this kind of allegation. I thought they might say, oh, she tried to take advantage of our dad for money. I expected that. I did not expect this. I mean, my mouth literally dropped when I heard about it. And I hear more about it, you know, every every day, quite frankly, something else comes out from that particular person. So you, you told us earlier in response to some of these allegations that you had not, um, th that your position on abortion hasn't ever changed. You've been pro-choice your whole life. Correct. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, is there an issue where you have evolved? Something that you had a position uh, when you were younger that you believed in that over time you've changed what you believe? I'm sure I have. I can't think of one right now. Okay. But I think everybody yeah. does as you grow yeah, and mature, right? I, I, I as you, you grow and mature. <laughs> yeah, right. I just didn't know if there was something else. Because you had mentioned that even in college you were writing papers on pro-choice issues. Is that correct? I wasn't. My friend was. Oh, your friend was. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So when it comes to abortion, will you only vote one way on abortion? Or how will you vote on abortion? It'll depend on how the case is framed, and that is what I've been saying, you know, over and over to people. I don't know how the issue is going to be framed. I don't know what the briefs are going to say. I don't know what the arguments are going to be. I have absolutely no idea. I will follow the law, and I will uphold the Constitution. Now, I say this in contrast to my opponent, who is, you know, he is endorsed by Wisconsin Right to Life. Wisconsin Right to Life doesn't even support a woman's right to choose in cases of rape or incest. Go and look at their website. You know, you've got this guy saying, I'm going to follow the, you know, my rigorous logic and get to whatever answer I'm going to get to. Go look at their website. Go to their endorsement page, and they have a picture of him. And they say, we have endorsed candidates who pledge, that's the word they use, pledge to uphold our values. Pledge to uphold our values. And there's a picture of him. And, you know, you read a little bit more about Wisconsin Right to Life and their executive director or one of their directors, I'm not sure, it was their executive director, and he states, we want to tighten things up even more than they are already, already in the state of Wisconsin. So I would have to say this, you know, I will evaluate the case on a case-by-case -case basis, but if my opponent is pretending to you or anybody else that he's going to look at that with a clean slate, I find that disingenuous. I know it's in the Constitution that the Supreme Court justice is a nonpartisan office, but isn't that at this point just a ruse? I mean, every election it seems like we end up with a, a candidate who's predominantly supported by Democrats and one that's predominantly supported by Republicans. And, and I know uh, we had a circuit court judge who asked if he could campaign as a Democrat um, for something else. But I mean, doesn't it strike you that, that 
this is all just sort of a, I mean, that we all are play acting like this is a nonpartisan election? Not really, and here's why. There are issues that span, you know, the far left to the middle and to the right. And, you know, I'd say this, um, like community safety for one. Everybody cares about community safety. You know, you think about it and you say, yeah, there are a couple of hot button issues, really hot button issues, mm -hmm. like the abortion issue and the maps, right? Where you'd say, yes, that person aligns as a Democrat. That being said, there are lots of other issues that come up in front of the Supreme Court that might not be as interesting <laughs> or controversial right. that, you know, are pretty nonpartisan. So you know, there's that handful of issues that might be considered more partisan than others. How would you, I mean, you've gone through this obviously firsthand now, but you know, two more weeks or so for the election, but what would you do, what changes might you make in how the process is you know, other states might appoint a justice, or that might be truly nonpartisan. You know, or there might be other reforms about how much money can be given. What would you do to change the system to have a better outcome and avoid what you're describing as this, you know, intense debates around things that aren't important? So I would say this first of all: we are living in the world of the Citizens United case. So the limits on, you know, the outside spending, the limits on spending. We have to live with that. That's the system that we have to live in. Our United States Supreme Court has sanctioned that. I do not support appointed justices, and I'll tell you why. I have been traveling all over this state and meeting people and talking to people. You know, I talked to some farmers in a rural area, and they explained to me how the forever chemicals are ruining their farms. And these are small family farms, and they tell me how they hand them down generation to generation to generation, and they're losing their ability to do that because of the chemicals. When you hear it from the person, and you see the emotion, and you understand how it actually impacts them, that's a lot different than, you know, reading a dry brief, maybe, about forever chemicals in the soil. When I go to Barnevold, and I see these huge generators on the side of the highway that are physically rather unappealing. And then I talk to the people about them and they say, they're ruining our land. They're ruining our environment. We don't need them for the power grid. This is how much they cost. They're only making certain you know, people wealthier. And we talk about it and you really get to understand. I have been all across this state for the last year. And I will tell you, I thought I used to know the state of Wisconsin, but I guess I didn't really. You know, we'd go to Door County and occasionally on a judicial conference, I would go someplace. I have gone virtually everywhere. And I'm hearing firsthand from people what they really think and what issues concern them. And I don't think there's any substitute for that. So I really think it's important to be out, to be out in the entire state talking to people finding out what's impacting them. I think that makes you a better justice and more understanding of, you know, what's happening. It was on the, um, I was in Kashina on the Menominee Reservation a week ago, and then I was on the Oneida Reservation. You know, I majored in history. I know about Manifest Destiny. I know how westward expansion harmed Native Americans. But you don't know until you talk to people about how critically important those treaty rights are, how much that land means to them, you know, all the issues that are critical. So I don't know that there's a better way. This isn't necessarily an always pleasant experience, you know, dealing with these large amounts of money and doing this fundraising and going and talking to people about these issues. It's not always pleasant, right? Having these allegations hurled at you. You know, having to call people and say, guess what, I've never used this word that I've never used, right? Breaking my family's heart over it. But I don't know that there's a better way to do it. I just don't know that there's a better way. Um, in the, in the um, primary, you were asked about um, Justice Kelly's, uh, the university that he went to to get his law degree. You yeah. went to Marquette yes. to get yours. He went to um, Regent University, which was founded by Pat Robertson, the, the televangelist. Your, your answer was that, um, that they, they raised red flags, but you didn't elaborate on what you, what you meant by that. Was it because of the religious nature of the institution, 
or was it that it was provisionally accredited at the time? Or what red flags did this have, the, the fact that your opponent ran uh, and went to Regent University Law School? Well, number one, Pat Roberts is pretty extreme, right? <laughs> number two, it wasn't accredited. You know, I went to a Catholic grade school, Catholic high school, UW-Milwaukee on the U-Bus for undergrad, Marquette, you know, law school. You know, Which I, is a religious institution, yeah, too. Absolutely. So, you know, I'm a product of religious institutions. I belong to a parish in Milwaukee. I practice my faith. So, you know, I know he's going around saying she's making fun of me because I'm a Christian. I'm not. I'm a Christian myself. I practice my faith at St. Josephette's Basilica. But the bottom line is... He's in a very, very extreme Pat Robertson University that was unaccredited. So does it raise red flags? Yes, it raises some red flags for me. One final question for me, and that is, um, we were talking about transparency, knowing where you stand on some of these issues. Um, can you say, what would you say who you voted for for governor and for um, president in the last two elections? I'd have to say that since I told it to some other reporter, I should probably tell you as well. Um, I voted for Mandela Barnes and Tony Evers in the last election. Remind me who was on the ballot the election prior that you're no, asking no, no, about. Sorry. The president, I was just asking you, the president and um, in the governor's race. Well, for president, it, it was uh, Trump against Biden. Who would you guess I voted for? I, I, I would I don't think I had I... to ask the question, but I do <laughs> right. like to hear the answer. I've, I've been voted. waiting for you to surprise us at any point in this conversation. <laughs> Maybe this is the opportunity. No, I, of course, voted for President Biden. <laughs> I, so I have a tongue-in-cheek kind of question. I mean, when, you, when it comes to Supreme Court justices, what would you do? Say, say you were like, you win. Uh, how do you stay relevant? I mean, because most of them, I mean, after they get on after they're elected, you know, you really don't hear anything from them. They don't, most people in, that I know don't really pay attention to that part of it where they hear them and, you know, you're making, you're bringing up a lot of things right now. Yeah. How will we know that you're going to stay relevant and that you're going to do all the things that, you, that you're going to try to do? It's a really interesting question because I was in this courtroom on the fifth floor of the safety building when I was handling homicide cases for three years. And there were portraits of all these judges in that courtroom. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know who any of them were. I'm like, I'm in this courtroom, and obviously your portrait's on the wall here for a reason. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you're a deceased former <laughs> judge that maybe was in this courtroom. And I have no idea who you are. I mean, I think it just tells you that, you know, everybody's relevance to a certain extent is fleeting, of course. Everybody's relevance is. And we're all kind of like sands in that, you know, sand, what is that? What do we call that? Sand in the hourglass. In the hourglass. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We're all those, you know, we're all those sands in the hourglass. People are generally going to forget who all we are, who all of us are at some point. But the way I think you stay relevant is by really doing just what I've been planning to do here, hoping to save our democracy from this very extreme candidate on the right and rendering decisions that hopefully people are going to think are fair and impartial and set precedent for years to come. Yeah, I'll ask you a question on that. But changing gears a little bit here, the other part of the uh, Supreme Court's role is to administer state courts throughout Wisconsin. Yes. We know that there's a shortage of district attorneys throughout the state. We know that the public defender system is chronically underfunded. We know that there are large case backlogs across the state yeah. due to COVID-19. Can you give us your thoughts as one of potentially seven justices on what role you think the court should play in calling attention to those issues and getting them corrected? Yeah, I think attention should be paid to those issues. I don't know what a Supreme Court justice can do in regard to salary, but you look at the salaries in the district attorney's office for the assistant district attorneys, you look at the salaries in the public defender's office for the assistant public defenders, and you look at the crushing caseloads that they have. One of my best friends is in the public defender's office, and she went traveling with me across the state this weekend when we were campaigning. When on Sunday, I was visiting churches and doing other campaign activities. She was back at her office in the state office building trying to catch up on her cases. I think attention has to be brought to the fact that the salaries are so low, the work is so challenging, 
the um, caseloads are crushing. And that's both for the assistant district attorneys and the assistant state public defenders. They need better salaries. They need better work conditions. I don't know if you've ever been in the safety building in Milwaukee County, and if you've seen the offices that the assistant district attorneys work out of. Seriously, the first time I saw my office, I thought it was a jail cell. And I'm not joking. I thought it was a converted jail cell. You know, the work conditions are horrible. You know, it's not a place that you want to come into and work in. Unless you're my husband, who when he goes there, he's like, oh, this is so cool. It's like out of a 1940s movie. It is. <laughs> but, you know, I'm like, you think it's cool because you're not here every day. You're a tax lawyer down the street in a really nice office. But, you know, I mean, I think the funding has to be there. You know, we see what's going on in Dodge County, right? Their district attorney left because he can't keep up with the caseload because his assistants are leaving. I mean, I think a lot of it is work condition, caseload, and salary. But so many people are coming out of law school with these huge heaping student loans, right? You can't pay that back on the salary that they're starting, you know, DAs at. Just a, a quick follow-up question. I know we've asked a lot of questions about yes, you have. <laughs> um, the amount of money that's come into this race, and you know your campaign has accepted at least two and a half million from the Democratic Party. You said you'd recuse yourself from cases involving the party, but there are people who fund the Democratic Party. A lot of contributors to where how the Democratic Party gets their money to give out to campaigns. There, I guess just. Um, and both campaigns are taking money from parties. Both campaigns have got people from the political parties who are helping direct them. Um, you know, what do you say to voters of how can they have any trust in the institution of courts? I'm thinking about Charles Franklin's polls at Marquette University mm -hmm. that show the trust level of the public and the judiciary continues to decline. And I think we're going to go through this campaign. Everybody's going to kind of throw their hands yep. up in the air and go, this is terrible, but nothing's going to change. Um, how do you think you can help restore a sense of trust in the judicial system, given everything that we just talked about in this campaign with the allegations, the money, the tone of it being so very negative? Yeah, the tone is very negative. And I would say this. I've always been fair. I've always been impartial. I hope we can regroup and get back to that. You know, our Wisconsin Supreme Court has um, hasn't had the best reputation for the last 10 or 20 years. I think it's getting better. I am hopeful that it will continue to get better. I am concerned, obviously, if the voters of the state of Wisconsin elect an election denier who was integral with the, you know, with the fake elector scheme, that the confidence in our court is not going to go up. The United States Supreme Court, which used to be a bastion of respect, obviously that has changed there, you know, with the leaked opinions, the fact that people say one thing at a confirmation hearing and then do something else. I mean, I think that we all um, understand that that integrity needs to be rebuilt. If you win, it'll be six women on the, on the Supreme Court, one guy. You know, at the Milwaukee County uh, Circuit Court, a number of women there. Why, why is it that Wisconsin people like electing women for its judicial positions? I don't know. I think they may that think seem that to they, be that case? It does. I think that they may seem to think that, I don't know. I could only speculate, but hopefully they're electing the person that they think is going to do the job the best. Do you think there's an advantage to being a woman as a, as a judge? As a judge or, or as a candidate? As, as a, we'll say as a Supreme Court justice. I don't know that there's any advantage. You know, I look at my cases the same way I would look at them, regardless of gender, right? Of course. You know, that brings up an interesting question I've been thinking about how you've been very open about your personal views on certain issues. And you, you, were, t you were talking about touring the state and getting to know people and that affects you as a, as a judge. Sure. But then in another breath, as most judges would say, you say you're saying you're fair and impartial. So how, how do you think that your personal views impact your decision making? Well, I think it's really good to have the more information that you have, the better, right? I mean, we live in this urban area. I don't know if all of you are from Milwaukee, but we live in this urban area. And, you know, I'll drive outside of the city. But I didn't necessarily really understand the concerns that citizens have. 
the more information you have, the better. How can more information ever be bad, right? <laughs> so the more compassion you have, the more empathy you have, the more you see how people are living, the more you see how beautiful our rural Wisconsin is and learn what people's concerns are, the better. But the bottom line is you have to be fair, you have to be independent, and you have to root every decision in the law. You, you considered running for Congress at some point. Um, there's an article from like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, where you said you might like to run for Congress. Have you thought about maybe, given your position and the way you're campaigning, that maybe you should have run for a partisan office instead of the Supreme Court? <laughs> I could not have run for a partisan office even if I wanted to, given the, down, right. given the gerrymandering and the fact that I oh. have the current job that I have. You, you would run against uh, Gwen Moore, is that right? Or no. Brian Style. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. But have you thought about running? I, you know, it's something I flirted with when I was much, much, much younger. <laughs> much younger. But, you know, once I got into the district attorney's office and started handling those cases, once I ran for judge, you know, that was really off the table. You know, I was approached about running for a congressional seat a few years ago. And I had to indicate I can't do anything, you know, partisan while I hold a nonpartisan seat. If you're elected, how long do you want to stay on the court? Ten years. One term? I have told people likely one term. I'm 60 years old, right? I would like to have some time on a beach someplace in my life. <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? <laughs> you, At some point. You, you mentioned your candidate and called him extreme. And I was saying, what can you say positive about him? I would say that any time you put yourself out and you do this, that you and... I think he probably believes a lot of what he is saying. I think that any time you put yourself out and you say, I want to be a public servant, is positive. Anything else? No. <laughs> okay. Do we have any final questions? We'll leave it for you. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Thank you. We appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.